I wish I could bottle that conversation. Because I, I, I kind of would put in a little atomizer and just spray it in places where conversation hits a wall and it needs the story to amplify in new amoebic ways, if there's such a word as amoebic. Um, wow, that was a, a great opening session and to David, Kyle and, and Gerald, um, what, what a presence they got us underway with. I feel like I'm well and truly here and I hope you're all feeling that same way too. And Jasper, I made it. Um, <laughs> this is the, oh, actually the other thing, if anyone would like a wonderfully accessible platform from which she's telling stories of relevance, stories of approachability, she's one of the most approachable people that I know. After you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we met in no other place other than a composting workshop where the, the thread, or th this was in our earliest days of meeting, the, the, the thread to that composting workshop was kiss the composter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we've done all sorts of things through her tireless work, particularly with Community Gardens Australia. And Hannah even piggybacked me in to MC a panel, I think, once uh, when we were in um, Launceston or Hobart. Devonport. Or, I think Hobart. it might have been Hobart, Devonport. Hobart. <laughs> um, she's an amazing communicator. Her communication skills just double down every time that I see her. And it's wonderful that this topic permaculture and climate action, because exactly 12 months or 14 months ago, I was here in Adelaide and Emmy and, uh, Emily and Lockie said, oh, we're, we're, we're doing APC, can you do a little video and um, tell people that it's on? And they said, pick a T-shirt. And so I picked this T-shirt. So when I thought about what am I gonna wear today, I wanted to bring this T-shirt because that was sort of like from the moment that it was incubated to bringing it here and, and all that effort that's gone in to getting us all here. And it's on this T-shirt and you can get these T-shirts. And these were all bought from the op shop and screen printed. And the message on there is exactly what our wonderful next speaker is, or well not next speaker, first speaker, our keynote speaker, Hannah, is going to speak about permaculture and climate action. Be happy. Like, really, you couldn't give me anything that would make me, other than some lessons in doing the butterfly dance, <laughs> um, nothing could make me more happy than to welcome Hannah as our first keynote speaker for ABC 23. <laughs> welcome, Hannah! <laughs> Bear with us. Oh. How are we sounding now? That's good. So lovely to be back in Adelaide. Should I just use the handheld mic? I can use the handheld mic quickly. It's off? Yeah. It's so nice of you here. I actually spent some time here maybe 20 ish years ago. For I forgot how beautiful it is. It is so beautiful and I forgot how delicious, delicious it is. I've eaten maybe 55 figs in the past six days. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Marie and Graham, and sorry. <laughs> But I'm here today to talk about permaculture and climate action. And a lot of people ask me, oh, Hannah, what's this permaculture thing you get on about? What is it? 
I, hear, my, I have two answers. To that. I say perfect design solution to create sustainable human settlements. The second one I say is a bit punchier. I say, oh, permaculture is just solution-based activism. And that's what really takes me, gets me really excited about what's possible with permaculture. You notice up here, I'll, I've said solution-based activism towards robustness and resilience for a climate-safe and just future. I've added robustness in there because resilience is really banded around now. We use it a lot to go, oh yeah, resilient this, resilient that. And it basically means what she was around, she didn't really know what it meant, but it was around. But amongst that herb nursery, it sounds beautiful, but I didn't love it. I was like, oh, I cannot wait to leave home, cannot wait to never work on a herb nursery ever again. <laughs> like, lock that in, like, lock it in. Uh, so I left home as soon as possible. And I, instead of going to university, I went, oh, I'm going to try some self-education in university. I was travelling around the country. Uh, this was before internet was kind of easily accessible. And I just noticed growing up in my community, I'm like, I thought lots of uh, really interesting people around us, they're saying certain things about uh, social, environmental issues, but the mainstream media is something really, saying really different stuff. And that's a young person just trying to work it out. How do you, how do you navigate that space? I'm like, oh, I'm going to go, go travel and look at the things and find out what's happening here. First stop was the Woomera Detention Centre, now closed. Turns out, mainstream media wasn't telling the truth. Second stop was some forest um, blockades in Victoria, and on it went. And, that was, that, and, and in that process, um, I landed in Adelaide, also known as Radelaide. What a beautiful place to be. Next slide, please, Tim. And... Here I spent, like, after six months of travelling, I landed here. I met some amazing people. Oh, guess what? I was working in a herb nursery. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really liking it. <laughs> it's so interesting. I say this to a lot of people, especially um, other fellow parents. And sometimes they worry. I'm like, oh, are we doing the right thing? And I think something that's really hold, I hold tight onto as a parent. I go, just shower them love. Surround them with all the good things that you, you're capable of doing. And then let them find their own way because that was the biggest thing for me. My parents, they like laugh at me now, my dad, and, and it's like, oh, you, you like herbs. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so powerful to meet people on my own terms. Oh, and then I met Anne-Marie and Graham Brookman. <sighs> Far out. Ridiculous, mind blown. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be like these crew when I grow up. Still trying, still trying. But they have such a generous, uh, amazing capacity to welcome people into their homes. Of course, I've got a pumping permaculture property, but it was their generosity of spirit that made me go, oh, I'm curious about permaculture. Maybe it's more than just gardening and farming. Maybe there's more than land management here. And that, that was the first moment I went, oh, there's something different here. But it took me some years. Over the next five or six years, I did lots of different things around Australia. There was a lot of um, informal permaculture work. Like I'd just turn up and go, hey, can I help in your garden farm project? And I just do that. A lot of volunteering, a lot of urban agriculture, small farm work. I did some study in community cultural development, um, and I did lots more environmental uh, activism, a lot of frontline activism, because I really felt that urgency so deeply. And then I got really tired again and again, especially with um, frontline activism, which is so essential and so required. And I just came to a slow realisation that maybe that wasn't the right activism for me at that right time. And so I went, I'm going to take some time out and do a two-week permaculture design course, also known as a TDC. And I was like, oh. Like I, I've, been, I've been around permaculture for like a good six or seven, eight years by then, like properly. I'm like, yeah, I, I know what it's about. I did it for TDC. I was like, oh, there is so much here. There are so many dots being joined. This holistic design framework, I can use this. I can take this and run with those ethics and those principles. I can integrate it into a life of activism. That's the missing tool that I've been searching for my activism path. And it's so empowering. And then here I am today, I wear lots of different hats, but everything I do is informed by activism, permaculture, and really importantly, climate action. So I weave it all together. All our paths are windy, aren't they? We all try these things out, but it's so nice to see all those threads coming together at certain times in your life. Next slide, please, Tim. Mm -hmm. So, for me, permaculture's superpower is that it's decentralised. So many people are able to access this across the world, not just Australia, because it's decentralised. So, informal education has been a real superpower for it, I believe. 
And this other amazing thing is that it can be used for solution-based activism. So that's where we'll find you again and again. I love how it helps identify what isn't okay, what the challenges in the world, and then it goes, hey, here are some solutions, or here's some pathways to start figuring out new solutions. That's an empowering thing I really love. And with the climate crisis in mind, it's such a joy to help shift that really dominant narrative from one of doom and gloom to one of hope, a radical hope and opportunity. I think that's a fantastic place to be. So we'll switch over to the next slide. And I, I forgot to say at the beginning, this I'm really focusing in on a kind of an Australian context for this chat, knowing that there'll be relevance beyond that, but some of the things I'm going to talk about soon will be more Australian focused. Now, when it comes to engaging with climate action, I hear these three things like again and again and again. First one, uh, what's the point? The people in, the power, in power aren't going to do anything anyway. They haven't got a great track record with politics and industry in our country. They're not really doing anything. Understandable. The second thing I hear is, look, I'm simply too busy, too stressed, too overwhelmed, too everything, and that's really valid. That's a tricky one. I get that. I'm going to come back to that in a few slides. And the last one is, oh, I'm not the type of person who does activism. Fascinating statement, that one. Fascinating. Before I get to it, the first point up there, what's the point? The people in, the power, in power aren't doing anything anyway. Well, the people in power are only there because we put them there. That's such a really important thing to remember. And it's a really empowering thing to remember that they are there to represent our voices. They're only there because we put them there. So we can choose and we can hold them accountable and we can agitate and campaign and advocate for better, better representation. The second point, I'm not the type of person who can do activism. That just does not make sense to me. Next slide, please, Tim. What type of person can do activism? Well, anyone is the answer. And for an analogy, I had this idea that we might think about the, uh, the push-up. Yeah? You, got it, you know what a push-up is? And I had this amazing idea that I might do some demonstrations. <laughs> and I might practice this. <laughs> So we think of a push-up, we might think about something like this. Okay. I can only do one. <laughs> I feel a bit dizzy. <laughs> so that's one thing. Um, can everyone do that kind of push-up in the whole world? No. But did you know there are other types of push-ups? Yeah? Another one is this one. It's a hybrid. You go all the way down, put your knees down, and then you go up significantly easier. But, oh, and so both are valid, hey? Both are perfectly valid and very, very effective in what they're trying to achieve. But did you know there is more types of push-ups? <laughs> you can also just go on your hands and knees and just go down like that. <laughs> totally valid, very, very effective. But did you know there's more types of push-ups? I'm going to need a volunteer for someone to sit in the chair. <laughs> Thank you. So, no, no, you just sit. <laughs> so I was hoping for someone bigger because Brenna and I do not match. <laughs> but we'll see how this goes. So if you can't get down the ground, no worries. There's a push-up for everyone. So you can go back and you can go down. Here's Brenna. <laughs> you can, or you can go a little bit further up so you're more upright. <laughs> Thanks, mate, you're free. <laughs> very effective, very, very valid. But did you know <laughs> it is 100% valid and 100% effective for certain people to do push-ups in their imagination? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is something literally for everyone, no matter what your physical capacity. That's how it is with activism. There is something for everyone. Next slide, please, Tim. <laughs> This comes back to the second point that I didn't, I skipped over, because we all have different levels of privilege, don't we? And I like to think of privilege as a muscle. The more muscle you have, the more capacity you have to lift other things for other people on their behalf. As permaculturists, we can do some really meaningful work to work with people, communities, in collaboration to help transition everyone into a climate safe and just future, not just the people who happen to have lucky enough to be born into privilege. The more privilege they have, I like to think the more responsibility you have. And that's a gift. That's like, wow, that's an amazing gift to have. 
climate action only works if it's for everyone. Full stop. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, and then, oh, this is really helpful for me. So, leads to acting big. So, I used to have quite modest ambitions. I wasn't scientist most interested in how can that benefit other people beyond our fence line as well. A range of ways you can do those things. So, I'm not saying don't look after yourself, your family, your immediate people around you. I'm just saying how could else can it impact other people? It's awesome if you can have a good life. It's even better if we can work towards a good life for all. Yeah. Next slide, please, Tim. So, I'm going to take you through a little whirlwind tour of things that I do to build climate robustness and resilience. And I really believe anyone can do a version of for their context, for their capacity, depending on where they're at in their life. First one I'm going to start with is requires change in the time at very least. <laughs> Please, Tim. <Yeah. laughs> and we're starting with supporting First Nations people. So we talk a lot about climate action. I say things like climate justice, what does that mean? Climate justice makes sure that we centre ethics and people at the heart of climate action. So it's not just seen as an environmental issue, but it's seen as a social issue as well. And that's really important. First stop off is, is listening and working with First Nations communities wherever you are in the country and, of course, the world. There's an um, amazing Aboriginal Australian artist called Clinton Nainer, and he talks about the climate crisis as um, the stolen climate, as yet another example of what, of what has been stolen from his people from colonisation. Such interesting thinking to have be explored beyond those statements. Uh, Black American uh, activist Hop Hopkins has this quote here I'm going to read out. He says, you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones. Sacrifice zones, they're the areas that we pollute. It's the air, it's the ground, it's the water. They're, we're sacrificing them. We're saying, this is, not, this is not a useful area for us. We can pollute it. He goes on to say, and you can't have sacrifice zones without having disposable people. Disposable people, they're the people who live in close proximity of those sacrifice zones. When we pollute those areas, what, what are they talking about? The only thing that we can do is start those conversations and listen and learn. So things I do, please, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Tim. <laughs> I do uh, some really straightforward things which anyone can do, some or all. Listen and learn from the experiences of, uh, uh, lived experience of First Nations people locally and beyond, but also globally, because we learn from each other, don't we? So important to do that. I do lots of education, which is ongoing, lifelong. Uh, it's a load off uh, expecting First Nations to educate us about everything all the time. There's so many fantastic resources available that we don't have to support on their energy consistently. I do things like pay the rent. Danny from Permaculture South of mentioned this. Uh, pay the rent is what it sounds like. So I do a monthly donation, no obligation, no strings attached to donation to the Tasmanian. There are so many you could choose from. I went local, people can go national, just find out what's going on. The Tassie Aboriginal Corporation, like, oh, we've never heard of that. I don't know what that means. I'm like, oh, let's have a chat about it. So, oh, we'd love that. Thank you. So sometimes you have to set up these systems and have those conversations, and it's always a really successful thing. And then the other thing I do is I turn up. It's the basic. Uh, as, you know, you're trying to be a good ally. It's good to turn up. It's like, by to a birthday party, you should probably go. Uh, these people like, are so generously invited to rallies, the gatherings, online or in person. Whenever I have the cap capacity, I make sure I go. These are things that are simple and they're really, really powerful. But the bottom line is that when we support First Nations people, we're supporting climate action. Yeah. All right, next up, Tim, we'll move on. See what the next slide is. Oh, yeah, politics. People go, oh, I don't want to talk about politics. It's too, oh, they're not doing anything in power anyway. But politics is for everyone, isn't it? recent federal election was a good remembering of that with the grassroots movement called the Voices for movement. Seeing people run who had never been engaged in politics before perhaps going, look, you know what, I feel so I've been selected by my community. I want to stand for, like, to represent my people. So it's politics for the people by the people. It's brilliant. One of my friends practices asking people 
would you ever run for public? I'm like, no, nah, no way. He's like, why not? And I really love that. I'm like, why not? Like, why not? Is it because you've never thought about it? Is it because your family doesn't do that? Is it because you just hadn't imagined yourself in that spot before? But I think the why not question is a really important one. Challenge yourself on that. It might be, actually, no, I'm definitely not running for politics, but maybe in there you might unravel some other conversations, like, oh, maybe I could do that on a local, state or federal level. So ask yourself why not. I think it's a real power. And whoever's putting the big bucks behind political campaigns has sway, no matter what they say. It's, as a documentary, Craig Rewcastle um, directed, fantastic eye-opener for Australian politics and money and donations. We need to get fossil fuel money out of it, is the punchline, though. That's key. So that is, these are things that we can do, tangible actions for Australian context that can work towards climate action. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, because of money. I said money is power. It's true. The more we manage our power, the better. Individually, we might not have a lot of money, but collectively, we are billionaires. And we have billionaire power collectively. We can point that power any which way if we organise, if we collectivise. And there's some amazing examples of that happening nationally, globally. Uh, the divestment campaign is brilliant, really simple. It took me one email to change my super fund. But we're moving our money away from banks and superannuation funds into banks and other super funds that don't support fossil fuels in any way. And that's, that's devoted trillions of dollars. And it's a very effective uh, strategy. Business listens to where money goes. So manage your money. Even if you think, oh, I haven't got a lot, it matters. <laughs> so think about money. Wherever you spend it, wherever you invest it, it's a way of voting. And wherever you put it, they win, if you like. So we have to make sure who we want to win in this generation and beyond. Because globally, fun fact, uh, so 71% um, uh, of emissions are produced by just 100 companies. And the top sections of those top 100 is like all by big fossil fuel companies. You've got like uh, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP and Chevron holding those top spots. Fun fact, did you know BP, British Petroleum, in the early 2000s coined the term carbon footprint? They spent a sweet uh, $250 million on the marketing campaign because they were feeling the heat. They were going, oh, people are coming at us about this climate chaos, climate, climate crisis thing. How can we take the attention off us? I know, how about we make it their problem? <laughs> it's really very, very clever. There's nothing wrong with thinking about your carbon footprint. I think about mine quite a lot. That's not a bad thing. It's not okay, though, to deflect the attention of where real accountability needs and real action needs to be directed. So hold that in your mind. Absolutely do your carbon footprint, and they should do theirs as well. Yeah. Next slide, please, Tim. Because, as I said a few times, money is power. This person, Bob Brown, set up the Bob Brown Foundation. He spends his life active, um, being an activist for environmental causes. Uh, one of them is for the Takina, the Tarkine Rainforest in northwest Lichuita, Tasmania, which is a beautiful place. It's been recommended for world heritage like a million times. Hasn't happened. Uh, so important. And a few years ago, they went, oh, let's start this fundraiser. We're going to do running marathons through Takina. People are going to come, they're going to raise money. Cool concept. Um, they, I think they, ran, ran, they raised maybe like 60 or 70 grand the first year. A few years ago, my friend like, Hannah, we're going to run a half marathon. I'm like, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> but turns out, if you train, you can run a half marathon slowly through the rainforest and you can raise money. So this year, between 160 runners, we raised $418,000. That's amazing. <laughs> and, you know, what a cool example of how being an activist can just involve running slowly through the bush. That's so cool. Activism is for everyone. And it was really wonderful for us to be in that community because the trail running community, A, is awesome, but it's very eclectic and broad. You don't meet these people in your everyday life. And it's a wonderful way of um, making those new connections and just acknowledging activism is for everybody. How gorgeous. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, by the way, Bob stands at the, end, the finish line all day like just here, his partner, Paul, gorgeous people, and he'll hug every single person who crosses the line, if they want it. And like, oh, it's just like, Bob! <laughs> I got two hugs. <laughs> yeah. If you've got extra cash, 
fun climate action. Did you know only 0.5% of charitable giving in Australia goes towards climate advocacy? Not a lot. Two organisations I've highlighted here are doing brilliant work in this space. On the left we've got Groundswell Giving, they're a newer organisation who collect uh, money from people and they make a grant pool and distribute it accordingly to who good people apply. So between 700 plus members, they've raised over $1.64 million and distributed that really transparently, very, very well. They're a new type of philanthropy, if you like. And on the right, we've got Seed Mob, and I'm so stoked to see they've got a stall out the front to the right as you walk out. I encourage you to go talk to them in person. Doing wonderful work. They're uh, Australia's Indigenous Youth Climate Network, building a movement of Indigenous people towards climate justice. That, that's the kind of stuff we need to fund and put at the very front and go, yes, we need to support you. That's wonderful. I don't have a lot of cash. I live pretty frugally. I just spend my money on the garden, but then I just put money aside and I go, what can I give you? might not be overly impressive, but it's something. Collectively, we are billionaires. That's what I keep coming back to. Yeah. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, electrify everything. So we're seeing more and more about this, which is cool. So there's a newer organisation called Rewiring Australia. This is all their data. So in Australia, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions are mostly energy, around 78%. If we take that 78%, uh, around 60% of that is domestic from our daily lives. If we take that 60% even further, around 42% of that uh, comes from our, our households. That's quite significant. That's quite exciting as well because we control our daily households. We have more control over that. That's an instant or pretty quick thing we can address. So rewiring Australia. Next slide, please, Tim. They talk about uh, what can we do. We'll work towards switching away from your fossil fuel-based machines into uh, elect electric machines, efficient ones, powered by clean energy. Everything from solar to vehicles and everything in between. This one, people go, oh, that's really expensive. And if you're going to do everything overnight, it would be pretty expensive. But they don't, they don't say that. They go, look, next time something breaks in your house or something needs to be fixed or upgraded for whatever reason, make it electric. You can break the stuff down, make it really doable. If you're renting, it might be, oh, you know what, we've got a gas top um, cook stove. We can just uh, buy a $50 induction portable cook top and put it on top. Yeah? Those kinds of things don't have to be big and you can source out green power options. Every little bit helps. There's something for everyone. I've got an important note, note down the bottom there. I'm like, so another um, argument with this one's like, oh, it sounds like you're just trying to buy your way out of climate change. And that's a really valid conversation. You don't want to greenwash things. You don't want to say, yeah, if you just buy this, shiny new thing, everything's going to be sweet. As well as changing out those fossil fuel based machines and change our behaviour as well. You know, it, it really regulate what we're doing, how much our cons consumption is drawing our resources. All right, but, um, oh, next slide, please, Tim. Oh, build community. I do a lot of this, and a lot of people go, why are you bothering, Hannah? Everything you do just kind of stops, and it starts, and it stops, and it starts, and it stops. I'm like, ah, oh, mate, this is savvy, strategic stuff. My friend Dr. Millie Rooney calls it uh, building essential infrastructure for the non-violent revolution we need to have. This stuff, the community safety net, holds us together <laughs> through good times and maybe through, <laughs> cool, taking notes, that's good. <laughs> um, through good times, but also potentially challenging because we want to do, we want to be together. And we have these Tim. And it just took me a while to learn this one. I think it's one of the first times I met Costa, by the way, he's in the, in the middle there. I was running a compost relay race, very important business. Um, the local mayor's also there, picked at the time. We were funded to go, okay, we've got a serious problem in um, Melbourne with the inner city uh, organic waste in our landfill. It's the methane gases through the roof where it's, it's actually really dire. What can we start to do with community education? Turns out you can run compost relay races and have a lot of fun while addressing a really, really serious issue around uh, behaviour. Over a series of years, we did a number of compost relay races. People had a wonderful time and they also learned how to change their behaviour to show people uh, we're doing this because we love our world, because we have so much joy and love for our natural, gorgeous 
uh, ecosystems, which includes us as well. It's important to hold on to that joy and to hold on to that love. If that means doing a compost relay race, you do that compost relay race. But, and you can have those conversations amongst it. You can enjoy each other in that process. And you can work towards really good, savvy change. Yeah. Next slide, please, Tim. Of course, you can grow some of your food. Uh, local food systems equals food resilience. A couple of slides back, I showed a photo of Build a Community. One of them was my little daughter at the time, standing next to an old bookshelf that I put a colourful sign on that said, uh, food share stand. And we just put it on our friend's fence in the early months of national lockdowns with COVID and people were scrambling to access fresh food. We live in a suburb that's now quite gentrified. People um, used to be able to get whatever they want, usually. And they couldn't get fresh greens and fruit and veg. And they were scrambling, and go, Hannah, can we buy stuff off you? I'm like, nah, I'm just going to give stuff, and we're going to coordinate, we're going to organise as communities, and we're going to make sure other gardeners can give things too. And it was in such high demand. There was, there was lineups, there's, it's still there today, not in such high demand, because our food system change was back in action. But these things, uh, growing your food, it's like how can it help other people as well? How can we build community resilience, not just uh, personal resilience? Um, of course, you don't have to have earth to grow food. You can do it on your kitchen sink in a glass jar with sprouts. You can grow scraps from fresh greens from carrot scraps and others. And you can have a bird garden. You can do pot, pot plants. Next slide, please, Tim. There's so many options available to people. Oh, did you know 32% of Australians or thereabouts rent and are probably going to rent for the rest of their lives? It's very possible that that number will go up with the increasing housing crisis. How do we change our rental system so we can have a longer term rental, caps on rents, and some kind of line in there where you can access the earth that you're renting to grow some of the food you need? Connect with other people. We visit our place on the left, top left, that's what it looks like, and now it's transformed into a hot pink. Mushroom. Um, <laughs> but when we bought it, people were like, oh, that is bad land. That is bad land. It's steep. It's no, no access. That was pretty bad, actually, for a while. <laughs> but, you know, it's got lead contamination from old house paint just flicking around everywhere. Um, but I just really push back on that concept. There's no such thing as bad land. It's only good land. There's land that's been compromised, or mostly because of us, for different reasons, pollution, or whatever, um, like loss of topsoil, but all the land is good land. This is about how we work with it to restore it, to create new systems that can hold water and nutrient and life. It's just good stuff. I really wanted to emphasise that one. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, be a time rebel. I learned about this recently and I like it because it kind of um, includes everything we've talked about and so much what everyone here already does. That's a term I learnt from philosopher Roman Krisnarik. He's married to Kate Rayworth, the uh, founder of Donut Economics, amazing couple. Um, but time rebels are people who work towards intergenerational justice. So you're acting now and you're thinking, oh, what are my ancestors going to be saying about these actions in the future from 100, 200,000 years into the future? You're holding those really dear. So you're acting on behalf of future generations. And you include the future generations in really big decision making on a big macro or micro scale. Uh, the parts of Japan apparently have utilised this, this approach with the municipal um, community. And they've gathered a, a big group of people and gone, okay, this side, you're from 100 years in the future. This side, you're from present time. The issue of the day is this particular issue. It could be environmental, it could be around development. Let's discuss it and adopt the outcome. And there as well. It could be just you in a, a small work meeting and you have that same, same approach. And you might just leave an empty chair and go, OK, we're going to go around the circle. When we get to this chair, that's when we all have to switch our mental states and think about the people in future generations. What would they think about the issues we're discussing? Really simple stuff, really powerful stuff. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, radical hope. So um, people say, Hannah, how come you're so smiley and positive all the time? Well, <laughs> and when you work around all these things, you're always talking about stuff. I go, look, I think the science is still the same, so I keep on top of the, the really big facts coming through. And I adopt something called Radical Hope, which I learned it's called Rebecca Solnit, uh, an American author. And she writes about hope being something that you, radical hope is something you have in the face of huge uncertainty. In this context, the climate crisis, you have this radical hope. 
and you know you're up against it. It's an enormous challenge. But you just throw everything at it, knowing that it may not work. But you do it anyway, wholeheartedly, for your whole life, because it just might work. And together, that's a lot of collective energy to turn those sh that ship around. So she's got this great quote here. So sometimes people are, I hope's a bit fluffy, not very active. I'm like, oh, well, you haven't read this quote, have you? <laughs> this quote says, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It is an axe you break down doors with in an emergency. And that's a really powerful thing. I need to point out that metaphorical axes is not really saying go get your axes and bash down doors. But that's the attitude we need to take when we think about hope, those things. Because this great flower, this permaculture flower, some of you may have seen from David Holmgren, activism is for everybody. I like this because it reminds us of different categories, different pedals of activism available for us to dive into, depending on what your skill, passion, interest is. You can go, okay, I'm going to go here. There's seven cool pedals there. There's probably more if, we really, if you want them to be. And you can dive in there using the permaculture ethics and the principles and just weave them through. Go, what does climate action look for me in this area for my life in this particular stage I'm at right now? And it'll be beautifully unique and fantastically valid and effective. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, and oh, I've had a bit of artwork from this cool crew called the Farwoods. I love this one, the pomegranate. This week I learned how to bash a pomegranate properly with Anne-Marie Brookman. Thank you. It's quite violent, it turns out. <laughs> Very effective though. <laughs> but I love this artwork. Joy now, not joy later, not joy um, once we've done the thing. Joy now when we're doing the thing. I love that. Uh, I want to remind you that activism is for everyone. Find what fits you best and just go for it. And embrace both the individual and collective actions. And if you're doing those individual um, actions, make sure they, they point towards the collective good. So it's thinking beyond your fence line again. Uh, be a time rebel. Embrace that intergenerational justice because it's multi-generational work that we're all part of here. Uh, find your people. Companionship really carries you through good and potentially hard times, whereas isolation can So find your people and stick together. Foster love, joy and gumption. And I love, gumption's a really big one. It's a big one about to have a crack. My partner, after stepping back um, a federal election when the Morrison government got re-elected, we were really sad. We're like, oh, far out. What are we going to do? I don't, actually don't know. And then... We had some tears, we had some screaming. <laughs> and they went, oh, well, let's do something. And my partner and two dear friends went, let's address some of the energy, energy issues in our country because that's just being pushed to the side. How about we set up a second-hand import electric car um, business? Um, cool. <laughs> Did they know anything, anything about cars? No. Did they know anything about setting up a complex international business thing with multiple regulatory um, limitations, but they did it anyway. So they're just throwing stuff at the wall. What's going to stick here? We're going to try stuff. We've got nothing to lose. That's what gumption means. And that's fantastic. You can apply that gumption to whatever you're into. Have a crack. Bob Brown has got his new movie out called The Giant. It's about his environmental activism across many decades and focuses on the um, Lichwater, Tasmania's a beautiful forest. In that um, doco, he was asked many, when he was a young man, oh, Bob, aren't you worried that people are going to think you're too radical? He said, I'm worried I'm not radical enough. But, oh, good. <laughs> Love that attitude, Bob. Next slide, please. I think that's the, that's the, that's the energy, that's the vibe we're going to bring to every little thing. From Bre gorgeous Brenna Quinlan. <laughs> Push up. <laughs> Her artwork captures sight. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. We are the power. They are only there with their industry of, and they know that. What an energetic, grounded and beautiful way to kick off APC 23. Thank you, Hannah. Wow. That's... I met a Zen monk once on a lake in Austria and Obvious segue. they said <laughs> a very interesting thing about, you know, when walking, just walk, when 
drinking just drink. And I think when pushing up, just push up. <laughs> <laughs> and when you think what Hannah was talking about, there were so many wonderful elements we can not only latch onto, but as you said, activate. And I couldn't help but when you talked about thinking big, um, Mary Heath thinks big because, as you noticed in the opening, she was standing up because she knit, she's knitting a small square which is becoming a big square. <coughs> so Mary, is she still there? <laughs> oh, she's moved, that's why. I was wondering where the sound had gone. <laughs> I like the knitting analogy because my grandmother used to knit little squares that then, then go into bigger squares and bigger squares and bigger squares. And it's really where you ended up with the image about what can we do and if we don't have power. Um, Mary is powerful with her knitting mm -hmm. because her squares become something bigger than the square itself. Oh, what was that? Oh, okay, we've, we've got some time. Oh, we actually, I've just been informed, we have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, does anyone have a question? For, oh, bang, straight away. Mm -hmm. I'll, So fantastic, thank you, and thank you, Presto. Um, on one of your slides, you had governance and community land tenure. I'd love you to talk more about that, oh. open-ended, um, not directing the question in any particular format, but if you've landed on community land trusts, I'd be even more impressed. Community land trusts, like, you know, we are in a room of quite some amazing minds. I feel like actually do everything the way the structures of ownership and we tend to think of freehold ownership that we've been inherited as like a law of nature but historically that's actually part of the modern world post enclosures uh, so the the systems of how we collectively own and govern resources especially the distributed resources of land are one of those most fundamental things and we put that there next to the, the petal of land and nature stewardship because it links back to governing those processes, of course, that have become ex obscured because of the power of fossil fuel rather than the power that before that all came from, from nature in some form. So obviously into that petal built all the efforts at collective decision-making uh, from the most informal right through to ideas of how we reform larger governance structures. But obviously intentional communities and the whole relationship between, going back decades, between the, inten the modern intentional communities in the sense of can we design community rather than community that just organically evolves. So obviously it's a, it's a big area, but it includes all the informal things like how we navigate the ambiguous relationships between differences of power, between a land owner, uh, occupier, and a tenant. How do we deal with those issues of power and accept and understand there are differences and, and work with those and change those where necessary, but deal with them. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for us in comfortable middle-class Australia to come to terms with, because we like to think we're all equal. 
So navigating all those governance relationships of how you share house at the simplest levels right through to uh, all of the brilliant work and the learning that's come from uh, intentional... Thanks, Dave. I think it's really highlighting that there's so many more options out there, not the bread and butter that we're often presented. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, there no. we go. Hang on a sec. Just pass this along. Oh, sorry about that. Me not. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I think one of your early slides, you had sort of three points, and the second was about people that are feeling too stressed out or busy. Just wondering if you could talk a bit more as to what you say to, to that kind of response. Yeah, I kind of wrap that up in privilege as well, because not everyone has the certain type of capacity that others do. And rather than comparing ourselves and going, oh, Kosha does this, if I can't match his energy, which no one in the world can, <laughs> I shouldn't bother even trying. Yeah? So I'm trying to address that one. Right, I mean, with my amazing push-up demonstration, I was trying to demonstrate that there is something for everyone, even if it's seemingly small, it is still valid and effective. And so with, with, uh, the, I talk about the more privilege that you have. For, I should step back and say, if you're overwhelmed, you're just trying to focus on getting enough money to have food on the table, just keep focusing on that. Just keep doing that 100%. Your climate action might be voting uh, with future generations in mind. Full stop. And that is perfectly valid and very, very effective. That's where I'm trying to get to. That is so perfect. And so I think we often try to compare what is the perfect activist, they don't exist, or actually they do, and they look exactly like you. <laughs> so beautifully different and unique, but every single person comes out just right. Does that kind of get to what you're asking? Yep, cool. Up here, Hannah. Yep. Hi, Hannah, thanks for a great talk. You had a slide which is close to my heart about thinking big, and that's what my next session's about in the next slot. But I'm interested in your thoughts on how we can get more permies thinking about solving things at the scale of the problem rather than the scale of their backyards. Yeah, look, I would love to just go, oh, you just do this. <laughs> I don't know the perfect answer. For me, I can share my story is that uh, I have a certain level of capacity. I could whip up a garden. That, that big one took a lot longer. But in my ren rental backyards, I, I got used to doing things really quickly, like, Within three months, you're eating veggies. Within six months, you're harvesting ca like carrots and pumpkins and garlics. You can do things really quickly. And I get to that point and go, oh, what next? I've got, I'm sorted. I'm good. What else can I do? So in there is a story about meet your needs first because once you're um, taken care of in all your ways, you can then be really useful for other people. So you, you can't ignore yourself. You can't go, oh, I can't do anything for myself um, and then give yourself to the world. You have to be fed, you have to be nourished all the ways that you, have to, that you can be nourished and then you're most useful and, and that's, that's kind of where I've landed. So everything you do at home, make sure it can just bleed out of your property, there's no blood being shed, into benefiting <laughs> other people as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, um, I think that's sort of pretty much it for questions because in a little while a big gong is going to go which... Uh, implies that there's the, the next round of talks for you to move out to. But I, I think, I'll just finish by, you know, I, I love uh, language and I think going off what Hannah said, I think, you know, the word, the word that stuck with me was gumption. Yeah. Gumption. Can everyone say gumption? Gumption. So, you know, if you go forth and get gumptious, act gumptiously, <laughs> I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's going to go a long way to, to solving some of these problems. But uh, Danny, wh what's next?